Good evening, dandies. Welcome to Undetermined, the podcast. Mike, I'm Matt. I'm the one you've been talking to. Hey, Matt. I'm John. I You haven't been talking to me, but uh, we're glad to have you on. Folks, uh, Mike Dillon joins us tonight on Undetermined the Podcast. Yeah. Been excited to have you on. We uh, we were talking a little bit to uh, uh, Matt Chamberlain while we talked to Matt for a while, but then towards the end of it, he uh, brought up Billy Goat, and then we started having connection issues. I was like, oh, shit, man. We really wanted to have that conversation. All right. But we're glad to have uh, the dude. All right. The founder, right? Yep, that was my harebrained idea that turned into seven years in the van without stopping. It was really <laughs> it was never meant to be more than like, you know, Matt, speaking of Matt, mm-hmm. the new book were off the road. I think they were in between shooting rubber bands at the stars and uh, Ghost of a Dog. Right. It was Thanksgiving time, you know, how the music business is. Everything closes down. Yeah. So... It was November 89 in Dallas. We're like, let's do a gig. And next thing you know, we got together and did one rehearsal because a friend of mine had a a steady gig. Uh, This guy named Reed Easterwood at this reggae club called Exodus in Deep Ellum. Uh It was every Tuesday night. And we were opening for his band called Pow Wow that I also played in. And before you know it, it just was like, the club was packed and it was like Billy Goat Tuesday. And there were, <laughs> you know, it was just sort of started as a joke. And then all of a sudden it caught on. That's the funny thing about bands. It's like, mm-hmm. it just seems like more and more shitty that either catches or it doesn't. Right. You know, and you, yeah. you, it doesn't matter if it's good. I mean, there are a lot of things that I consider good that don't get that popular. And there are a lot of things that are good that get popular. But popularity is definitely its own thing because I don't think we were that good. <laughs> <laughs> you were entertaining, though. I, oh, yeah, I will say that. We were entertaining and we were, you know, actually, I mean, band, music was fun back then. And, and we were part of that whole funk punk thing. I mean, of course, Chili Peppers were gods to us back then. Sure. Mm-hmm. BC Boys, Fishbone, Bad Brains, uh, you know, Primus. Yeah. You know, we played with a lot of those bands. Whoa, yeah. Did that make a clunk sound like my microphone? So, oh, you're fine. Um, that was what we were about and what we were into. And, you know, of course, hip hop was like, it was the golden age of hip hop and mm-hmm. yeah, all that stuff. I can remember rolling around with Matt listening to the first Tribe Called Quest record. That's the thing about Matt Chamberlain. And you hang out with that guy, and I went to school with him. Mm-hmm. He was always the guy that practiced longer and harder than everyone. Somehow he always had the best record collection. And, and to this day still, he just will be like, hey, check this out. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he's in the studio making some amazing music or recording tracks for Kanye or Bob Dylan. And, and then still time to like do weird stuff with his arps and his crazy drum setups and making his own music. Mm-hmm. You know, he sent me two tracks yesterday. It was amazing. So, but um, yeah, that's Matt's connection to the Billy Goat. That's cool. So yeah, so what y'all's y'all podcast about? I'm glad you contacted me. Well, we uh, you know we talk to a lot of people in music quite a bit. Talk to a lot of musicians, but we we're just kind of all over the place. Hence the name of the show. This is undetermined. We just talk to people that we find interesting. Oh, cool. And uh, things that we, you know, are kind of crossovers in our lives and, yeah. and things like that. And, and one of the main reasons why, too, that we wanted to have you on is I think one of the first, I don't know if I'm speaking for Matt, but uh, our fond memories of seeing Billy Goat and seeing you live go back to Springfield, Missouri. What year was that? Maybe, Matt, 90? Oh, 90-something. Yeah, mid-90s. Around that. 92 when we first started going there. Yeah, at the Regency. Right. Yeah. Oh, my at the God. The Regency. Yeah, we saw a lot of shows there. You remember playing with uh, or Slugworth opening up for you guys quite Slugworth, a bit? Yeah. Yeah, I was just thinking about Billy and Dirt Nap. And- Dirt Nap, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Billy- Slugworth. I totally remember Slugworth. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Billy says hi, by the way. He's been on the show. Billy. Yeah. 
but I was a friend of Billy's back then. Went to quite a few of your shows. They were crazy. They were fun. They were really crazy. <laughs> I, <laughs> they were a blast. I'll say, uh, I'll say this. I, I learned that uh, corn holes can hold more vegetables than just corn. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Broccoli ended up going into our corn holes. Yes, it did. <laughs> yes. yes, it yep. did. Making love to vegetables. Yeah, that was. Uh, Cry vegetables. Chef. Yep. <laughs> Uh, I had a good time. Yeah. It was early 90s. Yeah. Shocking for that area to see, but uh, yeah, I had a good time. We were just waiting for somebody to pull the plug, but they never did. Yeah. Regency got away with a lot of shit. Yeah. That was a fun club. Are we all in Kansas City now? I'm in Kansas City. John's in Columbia. Yep. Oh, Columbia. Cool. Yep. So I'm right down the road. But yeah, I mean, so you guys started off in Texas, right? Yep. And then you moved to New Orleans for many years. It was about, what, about 15 years or so you've lived there? Yeah, but, you know, Billy Goat did trans, we transplanted from Texas up to Kansas City. Uh Uh-huh. And then I moved to Seattle for a little while, and then I went back to Texas. And then in 2006, I moved to New Orleans, and I was there for 14 years. And uh, I still pretty much go between Kansas City and New Orleans, but ever since the pandemic started, unless I've had a gig or a live, I guess I should say a live stream, I haven't really gone down to New Orleans. I've done a few videotapes mm-hmm. for show people down there this, in this weird uh-huh. post-COVID world we're in now. Yeah. I guess we're not post-COVID, we're in the COVID. Yeah. Yeah. I wish it was post. I wish we were past it. We're not there yet. We're all ready to be post yeah well you were kind of a tour and fool played with a lot of you've got an impressive resume we'll just put it that way yeah i've gotten to play with a lot of amazing humans over the years and and yeah i love touring and um i toured right up until when the pandemic started but i also love writing music and recording and that's what i've been doing here in kc is just going in the studio all the time and having time to write music and you know, I did my first tour last weekend. I got gigs this week, and I'm going to do another little, you know, there's a bunch of outdoor events people are doing now. They're, you know, social dis- distant events. And mm-hmm. it's sort of funny, like, while I'm digging, going around and doing shows and seeing people, there's a part of me that's like, ah, oh, uh, I missed the studio already, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Does that surprise you? Um. Not really. As much road touring as I've done, I mean, I'm pretty tired of driving. I mean, drive, I love touring. I mean, I love playing. You know, whenever I'm on a tour bus or flying planes, that's pretty easy. It's, you know, if you got someone else doing the driving. Right, sure. But when, I, when I'm behind the wheel, I just want to take my time. So I got, I got an old Airstream now mm, cool. that enabled me just to sort of like, all right, when we start touring up again, you know, I don't have to play every night. It's like, all right, I'm going to drive 150 miles a day and then another 100. You know, I just want to take my time and enjoy it. Yeah. Go into like retirement touring person mode. I don't know. Start hanging out at RV campgrounds. <laughs> right. <laughs> Good Sam's. And, Trumpers and, you know, try to bridge the gap between uh, crazy artists and normal people. You know, because that's what I find. When you, when you get away from social media and you just talk to people. Mm-hmm. It's all bullshit. At the end of the day, most everyone can be become decent people right. if if they can just get through their crap and go, all right, right, you know, all right, maybe, may, maybe, you know. It's like I want to believe in my optimism that, that this country is not as divided as it appears. While I know there's a lot of messed up races, oh uh, yeah, misogyny and all that stuff out here, I still have a lot of hope. For when you just get people together on planes that are different, people have to talk, and then you know you get some common ground going. Mm. You know, my bass player JJ and I were talking about the, that this weekend. You know, yeah, I think that's a that's a big part of it right now is we're just we're we're in such a bubble, and we're not able to see that anymore. And, and you know, so many people short term memory we don't remember what that was like. Just to and God, I'm ready to get back to it. You know, I I hear you. Yeah. There is a weird thing that happens with people, and it almost does seem like there's a point of no return that worries me. Like, uh, we talked to uh, 
Billy Gold from Faith No More oh, a couple months ago. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And he, he talked about having having friends from like uh like Bosnia and you know the war there and just these two camps that were neighbors and friends at one point, now they cannot trust each other. Yeah. Yeah, and I and I wonder if that's what's starting to happen. Like if people that just don't understand each other and they've been inflamed are just going to be like, nope, it's just time to go to war. It's time to hate each other permanently. Right. Yeah. That's what scares the shit out of me. Yeah. I mean, because I, you know, I've definitely got my own political leanings. They're, they're more liberal and, and I'll say it. I'm, I'm rooting for Biden at least over Trump, but it's like, I don't know what's going to happen necessarily with my thought is, you know, maybe we'll get some of the crazy out of there. Maybe we'll get some of the racist out of there and maybe we can get back to kind of a baseline. You know, mm-hmm. we can get back to somewhat normal. And, uh, you know, I don't think Biden is entirely so left wing crazy that he's not, a, you know, he's still a capitalist, everything else like that. Maybe we can find some common ground. But, yeah, I don't know if people have been pushed so far that we're going to come out the other side of that. Right. God, my hope is maybe it's like, whew, well, that's over. But then, you know, maybe we're walking into a, a, a hornet's nest. Right. But, I mean, this is Jonestown level shit. Yeah, with some of these people, like they drank the Kool Aid. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, you know, and when I talk to my friends from Europe, I've talked to my one buddy who's an expat here from from uh, Jersey. He was Billy Goat's drummer after Matt left. Earl Harvin, great drummer, who's played with. C- he was in Seals Band, Michelle and De Cello, MC Nine for Jesus. Mm-hmm. The, the you know he's just he's like does what he does what Chamberlain does, but he's been in Berlin for 15 years now and you know he plays on like sam smith records big pop records and he plays in tender sticks and the dog right and and you know that those kind of bands i mean he's just he's killer mm-hmm. and you know and he's he's a black man from jersey he was my he's been my he and matt have been my best friend uh since i went to north texas and you know it's like okay you get it i was the the, the white guy from the suburbs right earl was the black kid from jersey and Matt was just a total like freak from Pedro. Yeah. And, and, and music has always brought together different people. And from a young age, we started, I know I was just a sponge learning from them in real time and, and vice versa. Mm-hmm. And that's why music is such a beautiful thing. Music brings together people. Uh-huh. Absolutely. The authorities do not like music. You know, that's why back in the 60s, you know, I was on tour with Norwood from Fishbone. He plays in my band a lot nowadays. Mm -hmm. He was on my last tour that I did, you know, that my big, I did a three month tour into the pandemic and Norwood did like a month of it. And we were talking about this same stuff, like how scary these white supremacists are are feeling. They're fucking terrifying. Yeah. They're they're terrifying and they're feeling totally emboldened under Trump. Uh Uh-huh. But he also talked about how during the 60s, you know, you had bands like Sly Stone, you know, you had all, and Hendrick, all these bands, very diverse crowds. Right. Music wasn't separated. And the powers that be made sure that everything got separated because they know that's the only way they're going to stay in power. It's nothing new. Napoleon, whatever you want to call it, Biden conquer. Right. But it's our job as musicians to play together and, and bring people together and, and, and learn about one another. I mean, I don't know everything. It's just, I've been on the planet 55 years and I've never seen anything like what I'm seeing now. Yeah. And when I talked to Earl, like last week, we had a, no, two weeks ago on a turn 55, he, we had a nice long talk and he's like, yeah, you know, for the first time in my life, I'm truly scared for what's happening in the united states yeah i think a lot of us are that way right like the rest of the world is looking at us for an example they're they're terrified about the u.s yeah they should be yep i don't blame them at all by the way i have met earl he played with uh glenn hansard right oh god yes i I was in europe last fall with uh ricky lee and i had an off night, and I've been wanting to see Glenn Earl with Glenn. Uh, so I, 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 we were in Italy, and they were. So I took the train up to Milan and hung out. You know, Earl was like 
bring your drums. You can sit in with us. Nice. What? Are you kidding? This is like a major, <laughs> this isn't just like a little club gig. Sure enough, like Glenn shows up. And he's like, hey, how's it going? Super nice guy. And like, sound check. all right, you're going to play those two songs. <laughs> right on. Yeah. I mean, he was amazing. He's just like a wide open. The band was killer. All these great Irish musicians. and Yeah, yeah. Glenn Hansard. Wow. That's all I got to say about that dude. Oh, he he's a cool motherfucker, man. And I've known him for, cool gosh, uh, 15 <sighs> many years. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I got I got to know him right before it, it all kind of broke out for him in the U.S. You know, mm -hmm. nobody knew who the frames were and they just kind of exploded when once came out. And he's the real deal. man. He is. He's just genuine. And like the guy you see in the movie, if you've seen once, that's him. Yeah. Yeah, he was so cool. And yeah, and Earl, I, I I know Earl isn't, I mean, isn't Glenn's regular drummer, but he's been using Earl a lot lately. Yeah, that was a great show. I watched, I, I watched the whole show. And you know how it is. You've seen music forever. A lot of times, even if you like the band, as a musician, it's really easy to be like, all right, that's cool. Mm -hmm. All right, I got an early morning, or I got to do this, or I got to do that. But like, okay. I watched the whole show and enjoyed it. Had a grin, you know. Yeah, yeah. It was cool. Yeah, we're also tight with Rob. I remember Rob actually. Uh, the Botchnik is the guitar player. Yeah, he's a badass. He's from Chicago, right? Yeah, yeah. We had him on a while back, and he talked about he was actually uh, trying to play some Zep with Earl and played Achilles' Last Stand, and then tore his Achilles that night. Oh, that's right. Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Skipping down the street. Yeah, that's a funny story. <laughs> Man, they, and they also have that other guitar player in the band now that sits down. He played with Leonard Cohen. What a nice guy. He's he's from Spain. I forget his name. I'm horrible with names. What a band. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Nice guy. I mean, from everybody I've met, I met Rob, and uh, we just had uh, Johnny Boyle on the show not too long ago. Yeah. Yeah, he was also their drummer for quite a while. What were the years like? What two thousand four to like? Yeah, for uh, four years, I think he was the drummer. About four or five. Yeah, four or five years. Yep, really nice cat. Yeah, you got to get Earl on here. Talk to Earl about things. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we love collecting frames. And <laughs> well, yeah, we, we <laughs> seem to be drummers. Yeah, we're, we're getting kind of a a circle going. We've got we've connected with uh, several friends of yours, by the way. That reminds me of uh, some messages I'm supposed to relay here. I, I, I was oh, yeah. <laughs> told uh, was told not to let you drive a truck, borrow a truck. I don't know if he remembers that from uh, from Dave. <laughs> Dave said, "Don't let." Me Apparently, you'll run over <laughs> his neighbor's car. His neighbor's cars. <laughs> Mm. Yeah. Matt was talking to Dave Abrazius uh, earlier today. <laughs> oh yeah, Matt. No, oh yeah. god. <laughs> Yeah, so Aberdeen's, yeah, we were recording a Harry Apes BMX record. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dave, and, and that night, I was in town playing with Critters Buggin. Huh? And Dave let me borrow his pickup, and he had a bunch of drums and stuff that I would use, so I didn't have to fly my stuff up, up there. Mm -hmm. So I got back after the gig. I was about to unload the gear, trying to park, and I just nailed his neighbors like 55 Chevy. Or something oh, like that. You know, something oh no. Car just back into it. And I was like, oh my God. And when I walked up to Dave, Dave was like, Mike, don't worry about it. It's just a miracle that we don't get into Rex more often. <laughs> Every day. Uh, <laughs> Come on in, pal. <laughs> oh, shit. Like, just can you imagine if we were all rock stars and had played in Pearl Jam? <laughs> right. we like, ah, don't worry about it. Let's go, <laughs> man. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm going to try to write, write a book about my crazy adventures with Billy Goat. But our first time in New York City, I pulled in and I'm like, driving down House and Street looking for the gig, you know. The gig was on West Broadway, and I saw Broadway, or, you know, I was all confused. West Broadway, Broadway, blah, blah, blah. So I don't know what I did, but I just was confused and made a turn, and I turned right into a New York City cop. Oh, fuck. And he's like, I get out, and I'm just like, oh, no. I'm just like scraggly, all the dreadlocks from yeah. 
Texas. And he's like, what are you, fucking stupid? And I was like, yes, sir. I'm fucking stupid. I'm so fucking stupid. And he's like, I can get a new one of these tomorrow. Get the fuck out of here. If you fuck up again, you're going to jail. I'm keeping an eye out for you. And I'm thinking, like, I'm in New York City. You're keep an eye out for me. Are you fucking I mean, kidding? He let yeah. me go. He let us go. Wow. Man was in the van so that was like our first trip to new york city as billy go wow yeah that would not happen in springfield missouri no you'd, you'd fucking go downtown <laughs> that's for sure that's for sure sure yeah, oh, yeah. Front of cbgb still back there yeah, right yeah you know there's there's uh videos of that on the internet it's, it's one thing i found like looking up it's it's crazy that that got preserved uh you guys playing there at cbgb's there's like that's yeah, funny that was like Earl was in the band. That was Earl. He, um, uh-huh. and my friend Jeff Lyles from Dallas. He was like this really. I don't know if you know Jeff, but he's a promoter. He he also uh, was in this band called DVT that had a record deal and was on the Color soundtrack. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, okay. you know, the New Bows get their record deal. And a bunch of bands like Buck Pets and the Trees and. Uh-huh. You know, he bought the Brad, Bad Brains, and you know, the Chili Peppers stayed in his house in 1985. He was just the kid that loved music. And I always try to tell that to people, like, you know, back in the old days, back in the 80s, mm-hmm. you heard, like, oh, there's this cool band coming to town called Firehoods, and the bass right. used to be in the Minutemen, you know? And Jeff mm-hmm. was that guy who was always right. telling you, like, one day he's like, hey, come over. We're going to smoke some weed. We're going to a concert tonight. Uh-huh. So I go over there. We're smoking weed. And he's, he's like, all right, let's go. And I'm like, where are we going? Longhorn Ballroom to see Fela Kuti. I didn't know who Fela Kuti was, you know? Right. All of a sudden, I'm seeing like the best show of my life. Yeah. You know? And nowadays, it's like everything is so like, uh, oh, I'm going to look at them on my phone. I don't know if they're any good. You know? Yeah. I, I wonder how many experiences there are for people where they're like, Hey, we're gonna go see this band. You never heard of them. I hear they're cool, right? Yeah, yeah. That it's changed. I think in that regard, and I know it's. I'm victim to more likely to check it out on my phone than I am to just randomly go to a show. Some of it's got to do with, you know, I'm fucking grown up now, and I got to do grown up shit, right? You know, and I, it's it's hard for me to find the time to get out to a club like I could when I was in college. Right. So, okay. If I'm going to go out, I want to fucking know I'm going to enjoy this. Cause I don't, I don't get a lot of these moments. Yeah. Right. Well, and it's, yeah, but that was the thing, man, back then. I mean, you had to just look at a billboard, you know, thinking of clubs like the Regency and you look at the name of the fucking band. You, you had no idea. They weren't signed to a label or anything else like that. You couldn't even get a record. You couldn't hear them if you wanted to. Even if you went down to a record store, you know, if there was somebody local from like St. Louis, for example, and it really hinged on the fucking name of that band, whether or not you were even going to check it out. Cause it's like, do, do you even have five bucks? <laughs> you know, do you have the time to do that? Right. Yeah. yeah. I remember seeing on the billboard, do I want to see this toad, the wet sprocket? What the <laughs> right. fuck? Yeah. yeah. Well, I want to see this band called the Butthole Surfers. Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> <It's time final. laughs> yeah. Yeah. I can remember that particularly about like Fragile Porcelain Mice and seeing them play from St. Louis. And it's like, yeah. Mm-hmm. The name, ooh, boy. I had to, you know, think about it a couple minutes <laughs> before I spent the money on it. But boy, I'm glad I did. They're fucking amazing. Did I see Ultraman back in the day? Yeah, I did. I saw them open for uh, Faith No More and mm-hmm. Mississippi Nights. Yeah. Nice. Mississippi Nights. I love that place. Yeah. I uh, hate that it's gone. I hate yeah. that it's gone. It's gone. That sucks. Yeah. Yeah. There were some good times at that place. We Billy got open for the urge there a lot. Yep. Oh, man. I love the urge. Yep. Steve and Carl and all those guys. I wonder how they're doing. I don't know. That's a good question. I, I've reached out. To uh, Steve, I, I tried to get a hold of him to see if he'd do the show or whatever, but uh, haven't got a reply yet. I don't know if it goes through like a handler or whatever for the contact. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious to know myself. Saw, yeah, you guys play with them and then Slugworth, of course, back then. And then you moved on to like KC, then out to New Orleans. You, but now you're back in KC. Yeah, I'm in Kansas City nowadays. And, uh, I can't escape Kansas City. There's always something that brings me back here. Yeah. And uh, 
you know, Kansas City is a cool, creative city. There's a lot of great artists here. There's uh, my wife, Peregrine Honig. We got married a few years back, and she's an amazing artist. And we were friends for a long time. We never thought we'd hook up. And then one night we hooked up, and then, all right, well, here we are three years later. Right on. Hanging out together. And um, she's doing this amazing movie right now based on, you know, she does a fashion show. Her, her and a group of people have been doing this 18th Street fashion show for 20 years. Uh-huh. And, and when they, they weren't able to do it this year, so she decided to make a movie of it. And so Calvin Arsenia, this great musician here in town. Oh, and, yeah. He is amazing. Incredible. Like, I love it that I can still find people that I've never heard of and be like, oh, my gosh. And so he's he's done a lot of the, the music and he's the, also the star of the film. And then they have like six designers from around the world. And they base it all on uh, Walter Gropius's The Bauhaus and, you know, that uh-huh. nightmare of Germany and, um, and that art scene. So they, they found tons of killer locations from like the Nelson Atkins to the Kansas City Museum yeah. World War One Museum to like 18th and Vine. Yeah. All these great spots. And they, they had all the the shots done around the city. And then he and I put the music to it all. And I just saw it right before I got, got on the podcast with you guys. Mm-hmm. I saw that piece of art. And I was literally just, I mean, Calvin's so amazing. I texted him. I was like, dude, I did not want to cry five times tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the whole thing is a, it's sort of about him and like, you know, he's 30, his life, his career's blowing up. Yeah. He's just so great. And he's supposed to play the Kennedy center and all these things. And Oh, wow. And it just really very simply not hitting you over the head, captured that feeling of 2020 being canceled and, yeah. Yeah. and tied it together. Those two did an amazing job. And I'm just, that's really cool. You know, I'm glad I've been sitting around recording, making music this whole time with my buddy Chad Mize. And, you know, Matt sent me track. All these all these great musicians are just at home. So, like, I was able to get all kinds of people to record on. Uh, I got three new records recorded. So, oh, wow. For anyone that doesn't know, uh, Calvin Arsenia is like this Kansas City. He's a harpist. He plays harp. He's everything really yeah oh yeah he does a lot of stuff but i think that's what he's probably best known for is playing yeah. the harp amazing harpist amazing singer yeah yeah he can sing too and very, just there's nobody like him that i can think of yeah there's no one like him he's a singular artist and i know like when we started the project it, i was just like all right cool not only was he acting in it he was going to every shot ever shoot you know on location he he was there such a part of this film they made i was like wow this kid has vision peregrine recognizes it and and, and it's hard to believe that he's only 30 or 31 i mean hmm. truly remarkable and then the more i talk to him learn about his life story it's very inspiring and thank god that we have artists like this no matter where you are in life and, and it gets back to what i'm talking about like through art you know you learn like that we're all got something to teach one another and to learn from one another and get a little bit of empathy towards walking in someone else's shoes you know that's what needs to be brought back like i don't know you know it really does it does i mean i i know it's disheartening for you know a lot of musicians and artists and everything out there with the feeling like everything's on pause but i think the one thing that i'm hearing though from fans and and people who are who miss live music is that we're on pause with you and it's like we're ready to get back to it too and like everybody's waiting with bated breath i don't think i think that there's kind of an underlying worry a lot of artists we talk to have that like maybe people are falling off or that they're getting disinterested it's like nah we're we're just we're waiting with bated breath you know bated breath is exactly great word i use that phrase in one of my songs on the new record, but we, we're all waiting with bated breath. I mean, loading gear for a, a little weekend run of gigs of playing on people's patios and a couple of like outdoor gigs for some businesses this past weekend. It was like, 
wow, I get to load gear again. <laughs> Incredible. Wow, I get to pack my gear up and I'm tired. This is awesome. You know? right. yeah. There's going to be a lot of gratitude for live music. And, and I think the musicians are going to be grateful too because maybe this pause has been good for everyone just to be like, all right, I'm refreshed. I'm ready to slug it out. Right. Well, and I mean, th- even when you're talking about like a socially distant show, I think if you would have talked to people like back in June and you said, we're going to do a socially distant show, I think back then maybe people would have said, mm, yeah, not for me. I think now people are like, go yeah, on. I'll take it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tell me more. Where is this? How many people can get in? You know, and, uh, you know, people are fucking all about it. Yeah, I'm doing one on the lawn of the museum tomorrow. Oh, are you? Which museum? The Kansas City Museum up in the Northeast. And okay. It's nice. They got these little diamond triangles they put out that everyone stays in. They bring drinks around the people. And, you know, it's a big, giant lawn. And Gogo Ray and I, a great drummer here in Kansas City, are going to do a little duo show, mainly playing music for my record, Rosewood. It came out. Yeah. Yeah, I've been listening to some of that. I really liked your cover of Hurt, by the way. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that was really good. I enjoyed that quite a bit. Johnny Cash, Walter Reznor. Yeah, it was a really cool interpretation of it, man. I, I got to recommend it to anybody who's listening. Check it out. Um, and yeah, that old Rosewood album is really cool. But yeah, back when, you know, I've seen you, Billy Goat, anyway, it was like you said, it was more funk, rap rock. Rap rock. I haven't heard that in a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I was thinking about, like, you know, fuck more, bitch less, and some of those tracks, but. I mean, were you always kind of a jazz guy, though? Yeah, I was classically trained. I went to North Texas. Mm-hmm. I studied in the jazz program there. So when Billy Goat first came out, and I played in a band, a prog rock band, that was sort of like Zappa meets the Talking Heads called Tin Hands that Chamberlain and Earl were into. So that was a pretty heady band. Uh-huh. I remember one of the Dallas music critics was like, Mike Dillon could have had a great career as a percussionist. Throwing it all away to be a <laughs> uh, You know, because it was just sort of like, yeah, I'd stepped away from like my classical, whatever it was, jazz. You know, I went, it was, North Texas is a great drum school. Clearly. Uh huh. Yeah, it's a great school. A lot of amazing drummers have come to that that program, uh, amazing musicians in general. But, you know, you see the bad brains when you're 21. I remember seeing them in 86 or 87. It was just like, wow, this is way cooler than music school. Yeah. <laughs> you know, right. You know, you're you're in your 20s. You, you chase a different dream for a while. And- well, I remember Matt talking about, you know, going to school there and just being so intimidated by all the talent that was around him, which is hard to imagine as talented as he is or what we see from him now. Well, he was the freshman, but he was, believe me, we all, in my mind, we all definitely were like, whoa, he's the baddest drummer here. Like right away, he was bad. I believe that. Yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> We all saw. We were just like, whoa, this guy's ridiculous. Yeah, that's not a stretch. The imagination at all. But he's a humble cat. He was, yeah. He knows how good he is, but he's he worked. Like, he would be practicing until 2 in the morning. We all practiced till midnight, but he would break the rules and practice till 2 or 3, you know. And they'd be like, you can only practice till midnight. But somehow he would stay in the practice rooms and go longer than everybody else. Hmm. Interesting. Oh man, one thing I wanted to ask you about too. I'm a big fan of theirs. You have a uh, you have a pig face credit, right? So yeah, Martin Atkins. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm a big fan of uh, pig face, and uh, we've had actually yeah quite a few guys in the band. Of course, it's you know what the bench is like a hundred musicians deep or whatever at this point. But uh, what what track did you record with them? Uh, I couldn't even tell you. It's very generous that Martin gave me a credit. I do know I went to like Chicago Sound uh-huh. or whatever, record. Mm-hmm. Uh, his manager for Pig Face and Booking Agent was Billy Goat's manager and agent. Ah. So we had that connection there. And for our second record, we went up to Chicago for like three days. And we just hung out in the studio with Martin Atkins. Uh-huh. And he was going to produce us. And Looking back on it, it's like one of those opportunities where I wish I would have 
gone with him and just been like, yeah, I have no idea what you're talking about or your process. <laughs> right. We were in ministry and PIL and let's do this. Yeah. You know, I just remember it being sort of like, I don't know. Back then I had a way bigger ego than I do now. Uh-huh. I mean, you know, Kid Rock wanted to produce this. And I was like, that guy sucks. Fuck him. I, don't like him. <laughs> I thought he was right. funny. He had always come to our shows. But, you know, I, I was I was just like, I didn't really think he sucked. I, I think he sucks. Not really sucks now, but, like, I don't like his politics now. And right. yeah. I remember he was just like this hip-hop guy. He was actually pretty cool back then. But we were like, oh, you know, he's got the flat hair top. He's always, uh, I don't know. Let's use this other guy. But the point being, like, you never know what someone has cooking in their brain, especially when it comes to producing. Like, I didn't know shit about the studio back then. <laughs> I know a lot more now. Uh-huh. So I think more for for us back then, like, instead of working with Martin Atkins, who might have taken us a completely different direction, we were just like, well, let's go with Jerry Harrison because I really love the talking heads. And maybe somehow we'll end up talking, sound like the talking heads and not understanding that, like, a producer, just because they were in a band, is going to make you sound like a band. Like, that's how naive I was back then. Yeah. You know, you, you read the Beastie Boys book or, or whatever. Now you realize, like, these bands that became super huge and made influential records, not only did they have great shows, but they really understood from a young age the art of making records, or they found someone to help them make a great record. You know, because it, it is two different worlds. Back then, we were just like, well, either you're a live band or you can make a good record. You know, you're one or the other. Yeah, not necessarily the case. I mean, yeah, in a lot of cases, it is the producer. It's the, you know, guy behind the board. Yeah. And I've seen that, you know, hell, seen that around a lot. Um, Just with different bands, who gets signed, who doesn't, who, you know, gets a record cut and who doesn't. There's been a lot come and go that I've seen the man could have blown away a lot of shit that's out there that's popular now that just people never got the chance to hear. True. Call Martin up. You never know. Cause he still might be like, yeah, let's do something. Mm-hmm. Oh, I texted him on Instagram. That's what's great about social media. Now, you know, that's the other side of it. I dropped Jerry Harrison a line every now and then when pig face did their last tour. I was like, Hey Martin, remember me? It's Mike from Billy goat. And he's like, Mike, awesome. yeah, I remember. What are you doing? And like, well, I'm on tour with Ricky Lee Jones, so I'll miss your show. And he's like, the Ricky Lee Jones? I'm like, yeah, the Ricky Lee Jones. <laughs> and often, like, you know, his brain goes back to where all of our brains go. Like, they're older. Of You mean, like, Chucky's in love? Like, I was 14 when I started my Saturday Night Live. You know, 14-year-old seeing a, a 25, 24, or 23-year-old. Yeah. It's like you're seeing a god or a goddess. Right. And you don't realize, like, you're only, like, nine years younger than them. <laughs> <laughs> right. I know. That that kills me because I've got an 11-year-old. Well, he's about to be 11 this weekend. And seeing, you know, adults that are just 10 years older than him. What the fuck, man? Right. It's like Tame and Paula's not that much older than your kid. Right. Maybe they are now, but that's another band. Like, look at those guys. There's so many cool bands coming out of Australia now. It's pretty pretty nice oh yeah absolutely yeah there's a lot of great music out there i mean at the end of the day thank god thank the universe thank the goddess whatever you want to call it for music that's one thing yeah that we've really loved kind of going back to you know oh going to the club and discovering new acts one nice thing about at least having a podcast we've talked about before is we we're getting exposure to all kinds of stuff that we probably wouldn't have gotten exposure to before. And there's some really awesome stuff out there. And I kind of, before we started doing it, there was a little part of me that was just like, it's just not as good as it used to be. No, it's still as good. You just have to look in different places than you did before. I agree. Yep. You just got to turn over different rocks and it's weird. And it's, it's hard to get used to, but in some ways it's easier too. you know, to flip those rocks. Yeah. But it's also easier for a thousand different bands that suck to make a record. (laughs) Yep. But there are some really fucking amazing back to Kansas City. Just this metro area. There are some fucking amazing acts that should I. There are so many that I'm just like, how are these guys not mainstream? Right. 
Yeah, who are some of your favorite bands from KC these days? Oh, uh, man. Well, big, big, big. Uh, they're actually Lawrence, but uh, Godzillionaire. Uh, Mark Hennessy from Paw. Yeah. Is Mark in that band? Yeah, he's yeah. a singer. Yeah. Wow, that sounds cool. I love Mark Hennessy. Check it out. It's, I, I, it's his best stuff yet. Yeah, the the new album, Negative Balance. Yeah, it's fucking amazing. It's great. Uh, Red Kate, also big fans of theirs. Yeah. And, and a lot of bands out of Lawrence and, and hell, Death Metal and Merciful out of uh, Topeka. Shit, we've talked to a lot of bands out of, out of Kansas City and Arson Class. Yeah. We're listing off the people we've had on. Yeah. But we listen to their shit. That's why we've had them on. <laughs> you know, who else do you like out of KC? That's a good question. You know, I've given Calvin a lot of props. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, you know, I go to the ship sometimes. The last show I saw was Greg Mice play. Y'all know Greg? I'm not familiar. He's like a 75-year-old B3 player. Nice. He's incredible. He's just been around forever. Amazing. That that was like the last pre-COVID show I saw. I've been hearing about some new bands around. Besides Calvin, I'm trying to think who else who I've seen that's new and young. That's pretty amazing. I haven't gone, you know, to see any shows lately. Yeah, nobody has. Don't worry about it. Yeah, but, yeah, yep, you're not alone. I, you know, I'm, I, I'm at the same studio where the Shiner guys yeah, are yeah, always. Sure. Uh, where they're, yeah, they, I hear they have a new record out. It's really cool. Yeah, it's pretty good. We had Josh on. Mm-hmm. A while back. I love bands like that that have stayed together forever and that just keep getting better. You know, like in so many ways, there's always new bands. I love artists that break up their old stuff and start new bands and new projects and uh. they outgrow what they were in 20 years ago, or whatever. But then there's also like, like my friends in Clutch. I just love the way those guys have kept doing their thing, getting better and better over the years and growing their fan base. And it, it that's totally inspiring me to me as well, you know, and mm-hmm. become good with JP and like, he is such a fan of jazz music and Elvin Jones and Johnny Badakovich. And yeah, we're always texting about drummers today. He sent me a go-go shirt with like Chuck Brown and trouble funk. And oh, cool. I do a little project with those guys called the small upsetters. And, you know, it's all these posts we had opened for rare essence. Mm-hmm. Uh, a couple summers ago, so nice. I don't know. It's pretty cool. No, nah, it is pretty cool. Um, Headlight Rivals out of Manhattan is really good too. Yeah, yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, who's the band who just opened for Calvin at Lemonade Park? Paragon has been raising, raving about them. Uh, I don't know. I hear they're badass. I, I should have gone and seen them. Yeah, I'm drawing blanks on right now on new stuff. I know Matt turned me on the Idols. I like those guys a lot. Mm. Have you checked them out from from Bristol? No, uh-uh. I'll have to do that. We will be. <laughs> of course, you checked out King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, Gary Lee Connor. Yeah, he's a Ooh, big fan. He really loves those guys. They're like the Mister Bungle of the younger generation, or something. Right. Yeah, I dig them. At first, I was like, what are these guys doing? They're all over the place, and I was like, wait, look who's talking. <laughs> right. <laughs> You do, man. You've got you've had some uh, eclectic stuff. I really have been getting into Dead Kenny G's. Yeah, that was a great band. I mean, I, I'm tooting my own horn, but dude, at the time we just thought we were sort of like Critters Bug and B Team because Matt didn't have time to do Critters. Man, a I love that name. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> enough. Yeah. Right, that's one of those, you know, butthole surfers coming. Yeah, I'm, I'll go check out those guys. I'll go check out the Dead Kenny G's. I don't, I don't need to know more. <laughs> right, exactly. Plus, Cool drew our T-shirts, so we could always sell T-shirts on tour. Hey, uh, we only made a hundred dollars on the gig, but uh, let's design our T-shirt. Want to buy our T-shirt? <laughs> right, shirt <laughs> that keeps giving. That's hilarious. Yeah, that was a fun band, and we 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 saw like. Billy Go opened for the Melvins once in like 92. And that's the prime example. Like, yeah, these guys are cool. I don't know. Seattle sort of sucks. I don't like any of that shit. Fuck those guys. Uh, I just want to hear James Brown and Sonic Youth. Uh, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> 
And then, like, I, I remember, like, I saw him in, in 2006 or – Dead Kings, these were on tour, so it must have been, like, 2007 or something. Uh-huh. And it was like seeing Rush when I was in high school or something. It was just like, oh, my God, or seeing the Bad Brains. It was just like the light bulbs went off, and it was so incredible. It was them and big business. Uh-huh. Yeah. You know, so – the Dead Kenny G's were really inspired. We already were on that trip of being inspired by heavy bands, but we loved, you know, instrumental. I don't even like to use the word jazz, but we loved instrumental music. So that band was just sort of a combination. You know, the, the band name sort of described it perfectly. We were trying to do our best to play punk jazz. Right. And you did it, man. You pulled it out. And I, and I was just really listening to it. And that's part of what was really interesting about it like it it worked it really did just kind of like okay this is this is a jazz that's really ex- going to be acceptable to a lot of people that otherwise would not even give jazz a chance yeah i remember we were on tour somewhere and i was sitting out front with the bass player brad hauser who was also in the new bohemians mm-hmm. critter mm-hmm. and uh, these women walked by and they asked the bar you know the bouncer Who's playing tonight? And he was like, yeah, we got Dead Kenny G's. They're a jazz band from Seattle. <laughs> and they go, ooh, we hate jazz. And they just walk on. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so funny to see people like, you know, well, they're a party funk band. Come on in. I remember we had a gig once, the Mike D band in, in Victor, Idaho. It was like the weekend. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's a ski town. So, you know, you're not going to have people there looking for, like, you know, noise metal or, like, <laughs> right. you know, ice and, I can't even say their name, but like, German, who are those guys, Ice and Bob and Nubenhagen or whatever they're talking about. <laughs> yeah, you know, like, <laughs> They're not going to be going to see Coil right. or something really arty in like mm-hmm. Victor, Idaho. <laughs> so the promoter had a solicitous Mike Dillon, experimental free jazz. <laughs> 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 and then we had like five people each night. And yeah. it was like, uh, Find another way. Yeah. Uh, the, the wine tasters and shit are showing up. And <laughs> yeah, they're just like, uh. ponytail guys. <laughs> hey, honey, I want to go see some experimental free jazz. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like laughing about it all. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. The Black Creatures, that's who it was. Yep, yep. I hear they are awesome. But they're one of Peregrine's favorite new bands. Cool. Yeah. So I, they're on my list to go see. Calvin was raving about them. Huh. Well, we'll check them out. Yeah, you know, that's easy. It's like, that's the thing. Like, once you get in your 50s, you're like, at least for me, I'm just like, eh, I've seen it all. I saw the Bad Brains in 55, kid. Eh." Right. Yeah. No, there's still cool shit out there that's mind-blowing. Have you checked out that band Jesus Piece? Huh? No. They're like a hardcore band that's pretty radical. Somehow I found them on Instagram, and they got tons of kids that come to their shows, and they do shows with, like, the Crow Mags. Oh, okay. that you know i saw the crow mags two summers ago yeah i was like wow these guys are still about as hardcore as it comes because you go see bad brains and yeah you know hr is pretty mellow these days but john is still scaring 10 year olds yeah and running fucking marathons and shit and right yeah <laughs> i'm gonna do an iron man today you guys fuck off <laughs> All on a plant based diet. Uh. <laughs> yeah, didn't he like ran like three in a weekend or some shit? It's like Jesus Christ. Yeah, yeah, that guy just not have an off button. I'm in better shape than you kids. I dare you to come to my shows. <laughs> right, guy just not have an off switch. But you've been associated. You've done a lot of really interesting, new, and and brave things. I think, and you've also worked with some people that do. Some stuff that just, you know, is a little bit uh, not as traditional and out there. You know, Les Claypool, you've played with him? Yep, Les is great. I mean, I feel very fortunate to work with a lot of artists that I like their music. I mean, the first time I saw Primus, I was like, wow, these guys are weird. I like them. Exactly, yeah. And uh, when I started playing with him, uh, he was like, I played with Carl Denson for a minute. Like when I quit doing drugs, all of a sudden I started getting called to play with other people. Uh-huh. I was like, hmm, wonder why they're starting to call me. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder. So I remember when Les called me, I'd met him. Like uh, the Malachi Papers from Kansas City had opened for the Frog Brigade or something. And mm-hmm. 
I ended up sitting in with them and we had a good rapport and some tasty jams. You know, timing wise, it worked good. I think Les just needed a break from Primus. They had been doing it for so long and it was the top of the 2000s and the jam band world was exciting to a lot of people. And, you know, that's the cool thing about Les. He can go on tour with Slayer or he can go on tour with, you know, Oysterhead right. with the Deep Fish, you know. I mean, he. He skirt and people from both worlds love him. Right. Audition for Metallica. Yeah. Audition for Metallica. You know, I remember when we were playing, like pulled in the Mississippi Nights. The first tour I did, someone was there like, blah, blah, blah. Danny from Slayer says hello to Les, you know? And so, but yeah, Les, man, he's just like, so when I went out to California, we did like a gig and I, I sat in with him twice he's like hey come record with me mm-hmm. so I hu- went out there and hung out with him and right away was there for like 10 days two weeks learning about his recording process and it really is very organic and he, he comes up with these little songs and I learned real quick that he's just one of those guys that write songs on the spot huh. that are really compelling and that it, he he's just a natural composer that's really what he is. He's like our generation's Tom Waits or whatever, you know, for like the punk funk, whatever you want to call it. Right. Ooh, good question. You got any Tom Waits stories when you come across him? Well, yeah, Les would talk about Tom all the time. I remember like that first record I did with him. We went on tour. He's like, yeah, Tom heard the record, D-Dog. He always called me D-Dog or Greasy <laughs> D. He has a nickname. He's like, Tom really likes a new record, D-Dog. You know, and then we, we rehearsed once at Prairie Sound where a lot of Tom's stuff was and he had done recordings there. So, mm-hmm. you know, and that was the other thing. Tom and Les were friends. So it was a pretty magical time for me just like being fans of both of those human beings and artists. Yeah. And uh, yeah, still do stuff with Les. We, he has this thing called Bastard Jazz and that's, we do it about once or twice a year. You know, I played in a solo band from 2002 to 2010, did like four or five records and then took a little break. And then 2013 or 14, into 2013, he's like, hey, Primus is going to do Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. <laughs> and I want you to come play marimba on it. I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, that's what, how awful his brain is. Yeah. I was like, okay, I know that soundtrack. How are you going to fucking do this in the back of my brain? And sure enough, I get out there. And he plays Candyman. It just starts. <laughs> Real creepy. I was like, oh my God, this is fucking awesome. All right. So, and then we recorded it in like three days or whatever. And then did one gig. And he was like, all right, when the record comes out, you'll tour with Primus as part of the Fungi Ensemble. Hmm. So that was like end of 2014 beginning of 2015 it's like a year of touring wow yeah it was great so that was like the primus experience and the less experience right does he stay in character we we were talking to uh i've told this story a couple of times just tickles me every time i think about it we had uh john axtell from uh psycho funkopus on he's kind of become a buddy of ours really got open for them at the night beam in 1990 nice yeah he talked about trying to get a gig opening up for uh, Primus, and he met Les, and he just stayed in character the whole time. Oh, well, give me a <laughs> yeah, Twisting his mustache and doing the old-timey voice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Les is an enigma. Yeah. I mean, I've been on the tour bus with him. He's also a really quite introspective, super cool, really smart, just... I don't know. I, I find him to be pretty inspiring. He's also a family. He's been with his wife forever. And he's got two grown kids. And yeah, you know, he really does like to fish all the time. I mean, he is, in a lot of ways, what he writes about. You know, he's yeah, he's another one of those guys. He's the real deal. Oh, that's cool. But not so much a character, but just who he is. But yeah, he, and on the bus, he's always cracking up. Like, hey, hey, yo, Dion. <laughs> you know, that's what that's yeah. You know, if he likes you, he has a nickname for you. <laughs> <laughs> right. Check this out. You want to know weird combination? I know I'm, I'm wired. I'm talking a lot. I drank coffee late. Oh, you're fine. To be ready for you guys. I did a double of espresso. You're good. But so right after the Primus scene enters, ends, you know, I was living in New Orleans, and we always do a lot of weird jazz gigs down there. I just call it creative experimental music. Mm-hmm. That's stuff I was talking about. 
people in ski towns don't want to see. But in New Orleans, there's like 30 or 40 people a night that will come out here hear you playing right. really bizarre outside experimental music. Mm-hmm. So one night, my good friend James Singleton, who uh, I play in Nola Tet with, had booked a gig for his record release at the Marini Opera House. And after the gig, there's about nine of us on stage. It was all his music beautifully orchestrated with moments of improv and then moments of, you know, through composed music. Afterwards, he came to me and said, man, Ricky Lee was at the gig. She totally loved your plan. I bet you're going to get a gig. And I knew Ricky Lee Jones had moved to New Orleans. Mm-hmm. So I'm on tour. I go out with my band. I get a call. Hey, my, this is Ricky Lee. Our friend, mutual friend Lexi gave me your number. Oh, hey, Ricky, how are you? You want to go on tour? I'm like, yeah, of course. I love you. When's it start? Next week. I'm "I'm on tour. (laughs) So anyway, we we found a time to play together. I I carved a little time out of my schedule because that's at the end of that tour. And then we started talking. So one of the last things I had said to Les, he's like, so who do you want to play with now? Because I need the primus, the fun guy ensemble is coming in. And I go, you know, I like to work with a great singer, you know, or someone like, you know, someone like Tom Waits, you know, someone who's an icon, you know, just some great singer. I've never worked with a great singer. And then, you know, it wasn't Tom Waits, but it was Ricky Lee who called me. He dated Tom Waits back in the late, you know, early 80s. Mm-hmm. And as Tom, I never brought Tom Waits up, but on that first week we played together, We did a Denver show. The first song she went into, and she always does this, a couple songs a night, she'll just play something, and you're like, oh, I don't know what the hell that is. Mm -hmm. She went into Heart of Saturday Night by Tom Waits. Oh, wow. And I was just like getting goosebumps because, you know, when Ricky does a cover, like, I remember she went into Sympathy for the Devil on that tour. I was like, ooh, I know that kind of beat. Here I go. (laughs) I started playing it on the bongo. She just turned to me, no. (laughs) (laughs) No, don't do that. That's dumb. And uh, so, yeah, it, it, I went from playing with Les to Ricky and she, in her own way. You know, she's just got a million stories. And over the years, she's talked about time with Tom and sure. how they just like sat around and worked on songs all the time and how intense it was and how in love they were. And, you know, she has a new book coming out. Uh, it's supposed to come out. It's supposed to be out now. Like this whole time right now, it's supposed to be on like a world tour with Ricky Lee. Uh-huh. It was going to start in April. And it's oh, gonna, shit. Yeah, like literally six months of touring went down the drain. Ugh. But that book's going to come out. And she's read me, you know, I've been in, I was in the van with her. She read the chapter about her and Tom Waits. And it's just like talking about goosebumps. And like, I don't, I don't think any of us, all of us that love music, we can always become like, you know, little kids again, listening to stories. Right. Is she one of those that just when you're touring with her, you you get like all these amazing friends that stop by the show? Yeah, you always get that with the different rock stars you tour with. You're like, oh, oh, who's that actor over there? I, I was out with Ani. Right. And uh, Ani was backstage and we were packing up. We're in Toronto. And, and, you know, actors always look larger than life. Right. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden this dude walks up to us. And then the second he gets up to us, he's like, Hey, you guys, is our Ani around? It's Woody. You know, it's Woody Harrelson. <laughs> That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. You know, uh, I'm trying to think who, what freaks have shown up for Ricky Lee. But, yeah, she's got her scene, yeah. definitely. Johnny Doyle was telling us about uh, touring with Marianne Faithful. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. He's a cool dude. I, I think you should do his podcast if, you, if you're if you up for it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I would be up for it. And you sent me a link to him. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, he, he was telling us about just being backstage, and you know, Roger Waters shows up one night, you know, and just, oh, hi, guys. And he says, I'm Roger. <laughs> it's like, yeah. And it's like really nice. And what, what do you do with that? Yeah, it's incredible when the, 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 big, the biggest rock stars are usually the nicest ones. I mean, very rarely have I, you know, every now and then you hear about the assholes, but in general. Uh, especially when they're not, no one knows they're coming around and people aren't looking for them. They're just pretty low key. <laughs> like Roger. Told him, Hi, I'm Roger. That's right. It's like, yeah, no shit. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you do that all the time. Did Matt tell y'all about that time? Like he was playing with David Torn at, at, at Knitting Factory? No. And I guess 
Thorne invited Bowie down, and Bowie just came backstage and same deal to everyone. He's like, "Hi, I'm David." <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We've talked with several people that have played with Bowie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he sounds like a pretty like he was a pretty cool yeah. guy, down to earth for the star man. Is there anything you can tell us about the, so you say you cut three and you've banked like three albums worth of shit, or you got those designated to a particular project or, you know, I mean, is there running theme or is it just a bunch of material? I'll send you the link to the person that came out on Bandcamp on Friday. Uh-huh. I'll send that to you, Matt. I don't know if I sent it. It's called Shoot the Moon. And that has Matt on it, Earl Harvin, JP from Clutch, uh, Gogo Ray, great drummer here in KC, if y'all don't know Gogo, who was also on Billy Goat. It's got my old bassist from Billy Goat, a couple of guys from the Mike Dillon band. It's got Shane Therio, who, he's, who was in the Neville Brothers and played with Dr. John. Oh, right on. Nice. He also played on the Ricky Lee records and the last record I helped Ricky Lee produce down New Orleans of hers. And then it's got Robbie Mangano, who plays with all the Zappa guys, and he played in Sean Lennon's band, Ghost of the Sabertooth Tiger. So a bunch of people, a bunch of my friends, I just started doing stuff here at the church on the west side of Kansas City. Then I would send, like, Matt a track and be like, all right, I need a guitar. I'd send it to Robbie or Shane, and and then we'd put it all together here. So it turned out, at first it was just like, ah, I need something to do, and then it turned out sounding way better than I thought it was going to sound. So we got some horn players. Like I got Nicholas Payton, the great trumpet player to play on a song. He graciously gave me a track. And then Stephen Bernstein from New York, from the Lounge Lizards and Sex Ma played on, played on a song, did an amazing trumpet part. And yeah. got some New Orleans horn players like Brad Walker. So yeah, it's just really a collaboration with all my friends. And the main thing I did was I didn't really tell anyone what to do. I just like said, here's this. Yeah. Like pretend like you're playing on a Brian Eno record or something. Right. Like (laughs) like, come up with something, you know, this isn't a pop record, but if it turns out poppy, great. You know, have you heard of the side four collective? Uh, I haven't. Yeah. It's a Irish project that's uh, it's, I think uh, Dave Hingerty is behind it mostly who's uh he's also played for the frames but he he just came up with a bunch of drum tracks and just sent it out to people and said do something with it and it's just like all the people responding with it it's pretty cool yeah it's exactly like that idea like i had the songs pretty much written and we'd be like all right i need someone who can sound like captain beefheart meets the butthole surfers (laughs) oh my friend robbie you know plays with band from utopia he'll be perfect and he loves the butthole surfer mm-hmm. so he knew exactly what to do but i didn't have to tell him that you just sort of knew yeah and, and it's cool being able to work like that and take your time and, that, and that's the main thing for me too being able to have like three to four months just to we started recording at the end of may worked on it all summer so that's the first collection it's sort of electro it's called mike dylan and punkadelic that's the name of the uh the compilation uh the, the collaborative punkadelic Mm-hmm. And we came up with that on the tour with Norwood and uh, Brooks, my resident guitar player in my band, the Mike Dillon band. So now it's Mike Dillon and Punkadelic. Nice. And then I started being like, all right, I work with all these great singer songwriters. Why don't you try to do just a record with just like marimba and vibes in your vo- voice, you know? Mm-hmm. So the, sec- the next set that's coming out on Bandcamp at the top of October is called Suitcase Man. And that's mainly just me and my percussion instruments, sort of like Rosewood, but with me trying to sing over it. So, Oh, cool. Yeah, that so sounds fun. Yeah, that's a little vulnerable for me. I don't do stuff like that. So that'll be my first singer-songwriter kind of record. Oh, that's, yeah, that's, it's interesting, though, man. I'm looking forward to it. So what's your uh, what's the band camp again? Yeah, it's just uh, Mike Dillon and Punkadelic, Shoot the Moon. Okay. It came out on October 3rd. And then the, uh, the first Friday in November, we're going to do Mike Dillon and the Suitcase Man. And then the first Friday in December, I'll do volume two of Mike Dillon and Punkadelic. Nice. And uh, then hopefully by then, the world's going to be a different place. Uh, well, I mean, like I say, man, we're, we're waiting right along with you. So we'll be there. God. Right. Yeah. Well, and keep us posted on on events you're doing. I definitely want to try and come see 
uh, stuff that you're pulling off. I felt bad that I didn't get to see you last week. I was really wanting to go. Yeah, I messaged you. Yeah, we're going to do one tomorrow at the Kansas City Museum. That'll be nice. It's, it's just fun to be able to get out and do some sort of playing. And whether there's 10 people there or 50 people or whatever. Yeah. You you, you knew how important the connection with other humans were was mm-hmm. when you were doing it. But now after playing into the phones and doing live streams, I'm so grateful to see a few folks at the shows and we're able to connect on that symbiotic level. Absolutely. That's good that people are starting to find ways to do that stuff again. Yeah. I hope we keep finding new and better ways and the world gets to be a safer place. Yeah, we've got to, we've got to, well, I mean, I mean, like I was just saying in last week's episode, there's, there's got to be a way to do it the right way. And it sounds like you're doing it the right way. Yeah, man. Matt's probably going to be able to get to a lot more of those than I can since he's up in Kansas city already. There's a place in Columbia I'm trying to come to. My booking agent's like, yeah, there's a little spot that's doing socially distant shows outside. But Rose Rose Music Hall? Is that, what, is that where it is? I think so, yeah. I mean, there might be a couple spots, but that's probably the one. That's the one I see you fitting in. <laughs> and they've, got, they've got a nice setup. Do you know Daryl? Daryl. Ask him. No, I don't think so. Yeah, he lives in Columbia. He used to be the Flame of Lips tour manager, and he tour managed Elliot Smith. Oh, wow. Huh. He's another one of those guys. Like last summer, he turned me on to that Purple Mountains record. Have y'all listened to that? No, I haven't. Oh, my God. Purple Mountains. That record's amazing. It's by the guy from the Silver Jews who, who passed away. Oh, yeah, you know, yeah, Silver Jews a little bit. Yeah, Purple Mountains is pretty much like his goodbye letter, and it's astounding. It's huh. beautiful beautiful music really great record and then phoebe cates and connor did a record together what's that record called that was a other new record i checked out that's a really cool record better oblivion community center okay that's a really cool record and then the old the stuff i was checking out last week that y'all probably know but i hadn't really gotten into was the smog and big bill callahan like i've listened to him a little bit over the years but for whatever reason i've really gotten to him the past few weeks hmm. have y'all listened to much of his music not a lot no see and this is exactly what we're talking about like having the podcast and oh yeah you need to check these guys out. oh wow shit yeah 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 the purple mountains record is really beautiful i yeah i'll definitely check it out it's definitely worth checking out. It's one of those records, like the second let listen, it gets better. I like those. Yeah, he's a king of wordplay. Some of his, he's got some good zingers in there. Yeah, I like those albums. You have to go back and revisit and just keep getting better the more you listen to them. Well, cool. It was good talking to y'all. Yeah. Yeah, it was great. I don't want to keep you on all night or anything, but... Uh... Oh, I can talk forever when we're talking about music. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we get the same way, but uh, we also realize people need to move on with their lives and <laughs> use the bathroom, too. <laughs> yeah, that's part of it. <laughs> Gotta take a leak at this point. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sincerely, thank you so much for yeah for joining us. And when this is all over, we're in the same town. We'll go grab a coffee or something sometime. Yeah, I like coffee. Sounds good to me. All right. Well, y'all take care and stay safe. Yeah, cool. It was, it was cool catching up with you. Thanks for having me on your show. Oh, man. Thanks for coming on. We appreciate it. We had a really good time.